Good evening and welcome to the University of Denver, uh, Newman Center. Many of you have joined us in the past and I'm especially gratified that you're joining us this evening. We have a slightly different format from the one that we have followed for virtually every, actually not virtually, for every other <laughs> Bridges to the Future event. This time our speaker is not physically in the building. That was not by design. Uh, she is in New York City. There is a blizzard. Uh, National Weather Service uh, told us about a half hour ago that they're expecting over a foot of snow, 30 to 40 mile an hour winds, and she was unable to join us uh, physically tonight. But she's going to be with us virtually. This is a bit of an experiment for us. So we are all keeping our fingers crossed. If you could join us in that, that would be uh, much appreciated. <clears throat> but we think it's going to work. Uh, we found out about this this morning and we made some furious uh, phone calls and arrangements and I would like to thank the efforts of the Newman Center technology staff the University Technology Services, and also the Cable Center. And let's clap for them now uh, in anticipation. <laughs> My name is Greg Fistad. I'm provost of the university. And uh, again, welcome. Uh, we are uh, engaged in the second of the three Bridges to the Future uh, lectures this year. The focus is on China. Uh, as you know, a country of enormous and growing uh, footprint, also a region that remains a mystery to many of us in the United States. We began this series in the fall by welcoming James Fallows, who's a national correspondent for the Atlantic Monthly. I hope you uh, joined us for that uh, talk. He has written extensively on China, and we had a very good evening. Tonight, we are pleased to welcome Dr. Elizabeth Economy. She's with the Council on Foreign Relations. And before I invite her to speak, let me introduce our moderator this evening. Dr. Frank Laird is an associate professor at our Joseph Corbell School of International Studies. He's the director of the MA program, and he is uh, also, uh, well, his, his area of research and teaching is technology and public policy. Frank earned his BA uh, with honors in physics from Middlebury, his PhD in political science from MIT. He's received several grants from the National Science Foundation, and he's the author of a book, Solar Energy, Technology Policy, and Institutional Values, a book before its time published by Cambridge University Press in 2001. The book was a finalist in 2004 for the Don K. Price Award for the best book in science and technology policy or politics awarded by the Science, Technology, and Environmental Policy section of the American Political Science Association. Frank is also a valued member of our Bridges uh, to the Future Programming Committee. Uh, he has joined us uh, for many years uh, in determining what topics and which speakers to bring to DU. Um, and I thank him for being our moderator this evening, and you'll be hearing from him a little bit later in our program. Our speaker this evening is the C.V. Starr Senior Fellow and Director of Asia Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations in New York City. Dr. Elizabeth Economy received her B.A. from Swarthmore, her Master's from Stanford, and her Ph.D. from the University of Michigan. She's an expert in Chinese domestic and foreign policy, U.S.-China relations, and global environmental issues. She is the author of the award-winning book, The River Runs Black, The Environmental Challenges to China's Future, published by Cornell in 2004. The book was named the best social sciences book published on Asia in 2003 or 2004, by the International Convention on Asia Scholars and one of the Cambridge Top 50 Sustainability Books in 2008. 
In addition to two other books, Dr. Economy has published op-eds in the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the International Herald Tribune. She has a number of scholarly articles in Foreign Affairs, Harvard Business Review, and Current History. One of her more recent articles was published in the May-June issue of Foreign Affairs, where she treated the complex layers of the U.S.-China relationship and the limitations to upgrading bilateral cooperation. Currently, she is working on a book on the geopolitical and strategic implications of China's rise. Now it is my pleasure and hope <laughs> to welcome Elizabeth Economy to the University of Denver. Thank you very much. Can you see me there? I hope so. Um, let me just begin by apologizing for not being able to be there with you. Uh, as the provost mentioned, we are about to be socked with uh, the worst snowstorm uh, of the season. Uh, let me also add my thanks to Kathy Grieve and the technical staff at the university, uh, as well as my assistant, Jay Ali, and, and our own AV program head, Glenn Goldman, uh, for uh, making the arrangements uh, under such tight circumstances to allow for this video conferencing. Um, with that said, it is my pleasure uh, to have the opportunity to talk with you tonight about the issue of China and the environment. Uh, it is an issue, I think, that has burst, really, onto the consciousness uh, of the world over the past few years, uh, in part, I think, because of uh, China's efforts, Beijing's efforts in particular, uh, to transform itself uh, from a highly polluted city to a green city uh, in advance of the 2008 Olympics, uh, in part, too, because of the very important role that China is playing as a uh, major contributor to the challenge of global climate change, uh, and finally, in part, because of all the attention that is now being paid to China as a green technology leader, or as Tom Friedman says, a green Sputnik. Uh, and in many ways, these various pictures, these various images of China, uh, make it difficult for us to understand whether China is one of the world's leading polluters or one of the world's leading uh, green uh, sort of technology frontiers. Uh, what I hope to do in the next uh, half hour or so uh, is just uh, provide some of my own thoughts uh, about where China falls along this continuum and hopefully offer a framework for all of us uh, to begin to think about uh, where China might go in the future. Uh, so I'm going to just to provide a very uh, brief snapshot of uh, where China's environment stands today, then talk a bit about uh, how China's leaders and the Chinese people are responding to their environmental challenge, and finally offer a few thoughts about the role of the United States in all of this and possible cooperation between the United States and China. Uh, so, to begin with, I think it's important to uh, understand that uh, China's environment is really quite a, a fascinating but complex topic in many ways. The country faces uh, the challenges of a developing country. For example, 300 million people in the country uh, don't have access to piped water, uh, at the same time as it faces the challenges of an advanced industrialized country. Uh, last year, China sold more automobiles than any place in the world, uh, including the United States. Uh, so China really faces an environmental challenge on every front. Uh, in terms of air quality, uh, China has 20 of the world's 30 most polluted cities. Uh, about a third of its land and two-thirds of its agricultural land are affected by acid rain. And only 1 percent of the 560 or so uh, million people that live in China's urban areas breathe air that is uh, considered safe by World Health Organization standards. Uh, the reason behind this, behind these statistics, is not that surprising. Uh, China relies on coal for about 70 percent of its uh, energy. I remember back in 2000, uh, people were predicting with some alarm uh, that China was going to double its coal consumption between 2000 and 2020. And instead, China doubled its coal consumption between 2000 and 2007. Uh, that just gives you an inkling of how fast and how dramatic the pace of change uh, can be in China, uh, whether on the positive side or, uh, as in this case, on the negative side. Uh, China also suffers because uh, it is very inefficient in its use of energy. 
uh, China's industries use anywhere between three and seven times more energy than those in the advanced industrialized countries. Uh, and their buildings are also less efficient uh, than those in the West. They're about two and a half times uh, less efficient, for example, than those in Germany. Um, as we look toward the future, uh, China faces a great opportunity and a great challenge as it plans to urbanize about 400 million people uh, between 2000 and 2030. So if you can imagine, uh, they're going to be urbanizing the entire population, more than the entire population of the United States. Uh, and the question is, how are they going to do this? Uh, are they going to have a transformative experience, uh, do something entirely new uh, in terms of all the buildings and construction, uh, in terms of the infrastructure, the, the uh, public transport system, or are they going to follow a very traditional path? Uh, as it stands, uh, it's not looking terribly good. Uh, already, urban residents in China use three and a half times more energy than their rural counterparts. Uh, but I think there's still uh, the future remains to be told uh, on this front, and uh, I think we can hope uh, that um, as China emerges from the global financial crisis, it's, it's going to place increasing importance on this uh, issue of, of green development. Uh, if you were to ask any Chinese, however, what he or she uh, thought was perhaps the most important environmental problem, uh, I would think they would probably say the issue of water. Uh, although China has the fourth largest freshwater reserves in the world, uh, it only has 25% of the world's uh, average per capita availability of water. It faces um, a water challenge, both in terms of absolute availability of water and in terms of water pollution. Uh, so part of the challenge has to do with the way that water is distributed. Uh, for example, the north of China is uh, far more water scarce than the south. Uh, it has about 20 percent of the available water uh, in the country, the northern plain, yet it has about 47 percent of the population, about 64 percent of the cultivated land, and produces about 45 percent of the country's GDP. Uh, agriculture uses about two-thirds of all of China's water today, but household and industrial use is rapidly rising, as you might imagine, um, given uh, increasing Chinese wealth. They're using dishwashers and washing machines, um, and industry as well, as industry is proliferating it too, uh, consumes a lot of water. And as is the case with the energy, it consumes this water relatively inefficiently, uh, using anywhere between four and ten times uh, more water uh, than uh, sort of best practices in the West. Uh, in urban China as well, uh, they lose uh, around 25 percent of their water just through leaky pipes. Uh, so you have a problem now in the northern uh, plain of China with severe subsidence where the cities are drawing down their underground water reserves and the land is literally sinking. Uh, cities such as Tianjin and indeed several cities along China's coast have sunk as much as 10 feet uh, over the past decade or two. Uh, at the same time as it's facing challenges of uh, overuse of its water, it also is facing the challenge of water pollution. Uh, most recent statistics uh, show that uh, about 25 percent of the water that flows through China's seven major river systems is uh, unfit for agriculture or industry. So it's so polluted uh, you can't even use it uh, for industrial use. Uh, about a third of China's industry simply dumps its wastewater untreated uh, into the local streams or rivers uh, or lakes. Um, and they just released, uh, Beijing, the Ministry of Environmental Protection, just released a survey. Uh, some of you may have seen it in the New York Times, uh, discussed in the New York Times, talking about uh, the importance of uh, the agricultural contribution uh, to water pollution uh, and how much greater this is than they had ever imagined. And this will be very difficult to tackle because now you're talking about changing the habits of hundreds of millions of Chinese farmers uh, as opposed to, uh, you know, millions of, of uh, Chinese factories. Um, finally, if we look at the issue of uh, land uh, degradation, and China is roughly the same size uh, as the United States, um, but about 25 percent of its land is considered highly degraded or desertified. Uh, and the desert is advancing at a rate of about 1,900 square miles per year. Uh, the State Forestry Administration estimates that 400 million uh, Chinese are affected by this process of desertification, and they anticipate tens of millions of environmental, internal environmental migrants um, over the next uh, uh, coming decades. 
Um, I did a piece a few years back for National Geographic, and they had a short essay, and they had a, an accompanying picture of a village that had literally been submerged in sand. Um, but they were very clever, uh, the villagers, and they turned it into a sand-based theme park with rides and other uh, kinds of uh, entertainment. Uh, but I'm afraid they can only have so many uh, sand-based uh, theme parks uh, in, in China. So this is a, a very serious and a, a growing uh, problem in the country. Of course, what China does on the home front also has important ramifications uh, for the global environment. And we've seen over the past decade or two that China's contribution to uh, global environmental challenges has ratcheted up quite dramatically. Uh, for example, uh, with global climate change, you know, China is now the largest emitter of the greenhouse gas carbon dioxide. It is also the largest importer of illegally logged timber uh, in the world and the largest polluter of the Pacific Ocean. Uh, one of the most recent challenges that we're seeing uh, emanating from China is that as Chinese multinationals uh, are going abroad in search of resources into Latin America and Africa and Southeast Asia, um, they are often exporting uh, some poor uh, environmental practices and, in fact, causing some protests uh, in, in various countries uh, where they're doing business. Uh, but it's important to note uh, that over the past uh, several years, um, with this Chinese uh, leadership of President Hu Jintao and Premier Wen Jiabao, they have taken a far more serious look uh, at the challenge of uh, environmental protection than their predecessors, Jiang Zemin and Deng Xiaoping. I think Deng Xiaoping and Jiang Zemin were really all about go-go economic growth and very rapidly developing uh, the Chinese economy, whereas President Hu Jintao and Premier Wen Jiabao uh, have spent much more time discussing the sort of social ramifications, uh, the other downside, the dark side of this kind of go-go economic growth. Uh, and the environment is one of the issues that they have targeted. I think they've targeted the environment uh, not so much because uh, there's a kind of Al Gore within the uh, leadership of China, someone who's consumed with the issue of, of the environment uh, and its sort of deeper meaning, um, but rather because they've come to understand how the environment affects a range of other social, political, and economic issues that really are at the top of their agenda. For example, uh, in terms of the economy, uh, the Chinese themselves, as well as many uh, outside economists and uh, agencies such as the World Bank, have undertaken a number of studies to try to understand the cost of environmental pollution and degradation to the Chinese economy. And the numbers have ranged sort of all over the place. But in general, they've, they've tended to concentrate, congregate around 8 to 12 percent of GDP. So environmental degradation and pollution cost China the equivalent of 8 to 12 percent of GDP. And, you know, what that means in, in real terms is, for example, they'll say um, China lost $42 billion worth of agricultural output uh, or industrial output. Uh, because there wasn't enough water to run factories, or the water was so polluted that it ruined the crops, or there just wasn't water, in fact, to, to grow crops. Uh, they estimate that there's um, $13 billion in, in damage caused by acid rain, $6 billion caused by desertification. You know, these numbers, um, it's very difficult to know how they've arrived at these numbers, um, what other kinds of numbers might be out there. Uh, but I think what's important in many respects is that the Chinese leadership is thinking in terms of this relationship between the environment and the economy. And in fact, of course, at the local level, you feel the impacts much more directly. So for example, in Jiangsu province, they're quite aware that seven rivers have simply dried up uh, over the past uh, decade or so. Or in the Bohai Sea, that the prawn catch has dropped by 90 percent uh, over the past decade and a half. Uh, so when you feel it, that's really when the, the rubber meets the road. And I think that's what it takes, actually, to get uh, local officials to start moving in, in a new direction. So the economic consequences uh, really are one very important consideration for the Chinese leadership. A second issue that has risen very, very rapidly uh, up the agenda of the Chinese leadership just in the past few years uh, has been the relationship between the environment and public health. And this issue has benefited from a very aggressive and proactive stance that's been taken by the Ministry of Public Health in trying to identify 
uh, these linkages. Sometimes they're identified perhaps somewhat speciously, but again, what matters uh, quite a bit is, is just the acknowledgement and the fact that they're thinking about this relationship. Uh, for example, uh, they say that 700 million people in China, so slightly over half the population, uh, drinks water on a daily basis that's contaminated with uh, human or animal fecal matter. Uh, and of this uh, 700 million, 190 million people drink water that's so contaminated that it's harmful to their health. Uh, the World Bank did a study in conjunction with the Chinese uh, that said that somewhere between 450 and 750,000 people uh, die prematurely uh, every year because of respiratory diseases related to air pollution. Uh, and more recently, the Ministry of Public Health has come out with some figures suggesting uh, that there's been a 19% increase uh, in uh, urban cancer rates and a 23% increase in rural cancer rates uh, between 2000 and 2005 uh, because of uh, pollution and environmental degradation. Again, it's difficult to know um, with real accuracy uh, how uh, good these numbers are. But I think it's useful to point them out uh, just to try to get a sense for what is beginning to matter uh, to the Chinese people and to the Chinese leadership. A third issue, and perhaps the one of greatest concern uh, to the Chinese leadership, is the relationship between environmental degradation and pollution and social unrest. Back in 2006, uh, the Minister of Environmental Protection said that there had been 51,000 protests uh, environmental protests in 2005. That is not an inconsequential number. Uh, and this could be anything from 100 farmers uh, in a province protesting the fact that uh, water from a factory, the wastewater from a factory, was polluting their crops and, and killing their geese, uh, to 30,000 people, for example, in Zhejiang province, storming uh, 12 chemical factories, not only because they believed that uh, the pollution from these factories was ruining their crops and destroying their livelihood, but because they believed that the young women in their villages uh, were suffering from an, an, an abnormally high rate of miscarriage uh, because of this pollution. Um, so sometimes these... Uh, um, protests can turn quite violent, uh, and uh, in that case, for example, police cars were overturned, people were killed, um, and uh, um, it's quite a serious uh, situation for the Chinese leadership. Uh, something new that's happened just in the past few years uh, in terms of this protest is the move from the protests from being really lodged almost 100 percent in rural areas to now uh, moving into urban areas in China. And this is a kind of different protest. Uh, these urban protests tend, first of all, to be peaceful protests, large-scale protests oftentimes, um, but also protests in advance of something happening. This is an educated middle class that knows that a factory is about to be sited uh, near to where they live, or an incineration plant is going to be sited near to where they live, a kind of uh, not-in-my-backyard uh, sort of protest. Uh, and the first one that sort of set this whole movement off uh, took place in Xiamen, uh, which is a, a beautiful uh, place on the coastal uh, part of uh, China, uh, when they uh, learned that they were going to site a large uh, $1.4 billion uh, chemical factory only four miles from the city center, that the local officials had agreed to this. And uh, so they... Uh, the local university uh, began sending out text messages, and uh, somewhere between 7,000 and 20,000 people uh, in May, June of 2007 marched uh, peacefully uh, over a weekend uh, and actually got uh, the plant to be moved uh, to another part of uh, the country. Uh, so that was a very important uh, first uh, example of an urban-based uh, protest um, and they tend to be relatively successful um, because the Chinese uh, government, especially the local government, um, doesn't want to have uh, mass-based urban protests uh, sort of um, flaring out of control. Uh, the last reason that I think uh, the Chinese leadership uh, cares about the environment is really because of its global reputation. And I think we saw this very clearly with the Olympics. Uh, we're seeing it now with global climate change. Uh, we saw it with the food safety issue. Uh, and I think, too, with the multinational corporations going abroad, uh, I know, for example, that the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is very concerned uh, about the damage that these companies may be doing to the reputation of China with their poor environmental and, and safety and labor practices. 
Uh, so there is significant concern within the Chinese leadership uh, that the country not be perceived uh, as uh, a, a large contributor to global environmental problems, um, but that rather that it be seen as some a country that is willing to contribute to solving these problems. So recognizing the challenge uh, that China is facing uh, with regard to its uh, environment, what is the Chinese leadership doing about it? In many respects, uh, the approach that the Chinese leadership has taken to uh, its environmental challenge is much like what it's done in terms of its economic reform, which is to say it maintains a very small central government apparatus it devolves significant authority to the local level, to local officials and, and to businesses. Uh, it engages the international community, seeking advice and expertise and financial assistance. Uh, and it allows a degree of private enterprise to flourish. And in this case, private enterprise meaning non-governmental organizations, genuine non-governmental organizations in civil society. So let me just talk a little bit about uh, each one of these um, very quickly. Uh, in terms of the small central government, I think many of you may be surprised to learn that within China's Ministry of Environmental Protection in Beijing, there are only 300 people uh, full time. Uh, and this has been the case for virtually a decade now. This number has not increased. Um, and you know, this is to manage uh, the environmental affairs of 1.3 billion people. There are, of course, tens of thousands of local Environmental Protection Bureau officials spread throughout the country. But in terms of designing the overall uh, central government environmental policy, there are really only 300 people uh, there. The country devotes about 1.5% of its GDP to environmental protection. This is a number that has remained relatively stagnant uh, over the past decade and places China somewhere uh, in the middle of all developing countries. Uh, and well below the 2.2 percent that many Chinese scientists argue is necessary just to keep the situation from deteriorating further. One of the things that Beijing does, um, and it does well, is to set targets. Uh, and um, I'm, probably many of you are aware that it has set a number of very bold targets uh, just in the, in the recent past uh, tied to climate change. Uh, for example, uh, it has said that it will reduce the energy intensity um, uh, of its production uh, between 2000 and, and 2006 and 2010 uh, by 20 percent. Uh, it wants to increase the role of renewables in its overall energy mix uh, from about 8 percent today to uh, 15 percent by 2020. Uh, it wants to decrease its water consumption um, by 30 percent um, by 2020. Uh, and it is, of course, making very serious investments in uh, clean energy technologies and things like electric cars uh, to try to move the country uh, to the front uh, of, uh, of the world in terms of the development and manufacturing and eventually, you know, the implementation and export uh, of these technologies. Um, but the truth is that real environmental uh, protection takes place at the local level. And, and China, for all that you might think of China as a very authoritarian or central, highly centralized state, it is in fact a very decentralized uh, state uh, where much authority uh, for environmental protection and many other social issues really rests with local officials. Uh, and local environmental protection bureaus are responsible not to the Ministry of Environmental Protection in Beijing, but rather to the local governments. They're nested within the local bureaucracy. Uh, and this means that uh, at many points, in many places, uh, they are particularly susceptible to pressure um, being put on them either by powerful companies in uh, the region or by the mayor. Uh, you know, when the trade-off is basically, you know, uh, fining a company or uh, closing down a highly polluting factory um, that employs 10,000 uh, local people. Uh, the choice really isn't a very difficult one for a mayor to make, uh, and that is you let the uh, factory keep running if it's employing uh, 10,000 people and bringing in revenues uh, to the local community. Um, there's also a huge challenge with other kinds of corruption. Um, a study was done a few years back by uh, an academy affiliated with the Ministry of Environmental Protection that demonstrated that half of the funds, half of the 1.5 percent uh, of GDP that Beijing puts into environmental protection, half of those funds, as they go down uh, the chain to the local levels, uh, are used for, uh, is used for uh, purposes other than environmental protection. Um, so this is a serious, uh, a serious challenge. 
And then there are issues of transparency and official accountability and the rule of law, uh, all of which remain really in a nascent stage uh, within the Chinese political system, but are essential uh, in many respects to effective environmental protection. Uh, so there's a big challenge at, at the local level. And just by way of example, um, for some of these efforts that China has been making, these recent efforts, for example, um, they've uh, targeted the 10 largest uh, power companies to have 3% of their electricity uh, come from renewables by 2010. And Greenpeace Beijing, uh, a local uh, non-governmental organization, has said there's only one of these companies uh, that's on track to meet this goal. So while Beijing may set very impressive targets, uh, while it may have many impressive laws and regulations on the books, the real challenge rests in the implementation of these laws and of these regulations. The third part of uh, China's environmental protection effort really has been to engage the international community. And it's been enormously successful uh, in this regard. Uh, for many years, it was the largest recipient of uh, environmental assistance in the world from places like the World Bank, the Asian Development Bank, uh, Japan has contributed hundreds of millions of dollars over the past decade to China's environmental protection effort in terms of loans and training and technology transfer. Um, virtually every non-governmental organization that you could imagine uh, based here in the United States, from the Environmental Defense Fund to NRDC to World Wildlife Conservation to um, uh, Conservation International, they all have extensive uh, operations in China. Uh, doing everything from helping the Chinese write uh, energy efficient building codes uh, to uh, documenting uh, biodiversity. Um, they're very, very active in China, um, in part because they, they view China as sort of the great frontier uh, for environmental protection, and in part because they recognize the enormous role that China is playing in terms of transforming the global environment. Uh, so it's important for uh, the international community be deeply engaged uh, in any way they can to help China uh, as it moves through this process of, of development and trying to balance uh, environmental protection and economic development. But I think perhaps the most exciting uh, element of China's environmental protection uh, effort and the one that gives me personally the greatest hope looking uh, over the next five to ten years uh, has been the very extraordinary, really, development of uh, the environmental NGO sector in China. Uh, and here I'm talking about uh, NGOs that are um, uh, pretty much uh, divorced from the government. Uh, the government has its own set of government-organized NGOs, but these are NGOs that have uh, sprung up uh, from citizen initiative, from individual initiative. Uh, and while they have to find a government sponsor or register as a business, and there are all sorts of reporting and kinds of political requirements on these organizations, uh, they basically set uh, their own path uh, and undertake their own um, approach uh, to working on environmental issues. Um, the first of these environmental NGOs, uh, Friends of Nature, was founded in 1994. Uh, that NGO now has 3,000 um, members. Um, and it was devoted to environmental education and biodiversity protection. Uh, at that time, relatively uh, politically benign issues. Today, however, you have uh, people like Wang Sanfa uh, for, at the Center for Legal Assistance to Pollution Victims who launches lawsuits against local governments and businesses on behalf of pollution victims and wins about half of his cases. Uh, or you have Ma Jun who uh, has developed pollution maps uh, for air pollution and water pollution, uh, where he tracks all the factories and the major companies uh, that are responsible for these factories and hunts them down uh, and makes sure that they're doing uh, the right thing, uh, in particular if they're multinational corporations. Um, and you, so there's a, a wide variety. There's an enormous anti-dam movement now uh, in China. Um, Really, Chinese NGOs uh, today express the full range of non-governmental uh, activity. And it's a very exciting uh, and dynamic uh, part of China's environmental protection effort. Uh, that is not to say it is not without its own challenges. Uh, the Chinese government is quite concerned uh, about the potential of these NGOs to play a different kind of role, uh, to play a political role somehow pushing the boundaries of political reform faster than Beijing is interested in, in moving. Uh, 
Um, because again, you know, environmental protection depends on transparency, depends on the rule of law, depends on official accountability. And all of these NGOs, each in uh, their own way, is moving the boundaries uh, in this process. Uh, so you find sometimes when uh, these individual activists cross the line, and the line can be very difficult to know or to understand, um, they're arrested, they're placed under house arrest or sentenced you know, to six years in jail. A number of very prominent NGO activists uh, have been sentenced to jail or placed under house arrest uh, in the past few years. Nonetheless, um, I think uh, it really does represent um, not only um, a very important element of Chinese uh, environmental protection effort, uh, but also they really are at the forefront of all civil society development uh, in China today. Um, let me just conclude now with a couple of remarks um, about the role of the United States uh, in all of this. Um, I think that the most important thing that the United States can do, quite frankly, is to lead by example. And uh, this is probably nowhere more clear than on the issue of global climate change. And there's been a great deal of contention uh, in the wake, in the aftermath of Copenhagen, about who is to blame for the sort of lukewarm uh, kind of um, muddled uh, agreement uh, that came out of, of Copenhagen. Um, but I think that uh, the fact that the United States uh, has yet uh, to pass uh, any real climate legislation uh, really does lessen uh, our capacity to serve uh, as a leader on this issue and in particular to urge China uh, to do more uh, than it's already doing. Um, so I think that one important thing that we have to bear in mind as we're working with China, as we're talking to China, and as we sometimes lecture China, is that we need to look at ourselves first uh, to figure out what it is that we're doing and what we need to be doing uh, better. Uh, the second is that I think we need to be spending most of our time not thinking about financial transfer and technology transfer, but really thinking about capacity building. Uh, and by this, I mean helping the Chinese develop the uh, laws, the regulations, the training, the enforcement mechanisms, the incentive systems, pricing systems, and other things that are the foundation of environmental protection. Um, China has a lot of technology at its fingertips already. Um, what it really needs is the policy environment uh, to make it possible to use this technology. Because if you don't have the appropriate pricing for natural resources, for example, it doesn't make sense to use a lot of the uh, technology that they've got. Uh, just by way of example, about a third of the factories um, have appropriate uh, water pollution uh, control technology, and they simply don't use it because it's not worth it to them. Uh, either the incentives aren't there or the disincentives in terms of fines and enforcement aren't there. So I think that when we're thinking about how we want to work with the Chinese, it's particularly important for us to think about how to help them create the best policy environment. And let me just finally note, fundamentally, China's environmental challenge is China's to solve. And um, we can help, um, but we help really, and the rest of the international community helps really at the margins because it's China uh, that needs to construct uh, the policy environment uh, to move forward. It's China that's going to look at its urbanization process as it's so rapidly unfolding right now uh, and to think through how can we uh, best accomplish this um, and is this getting ahead of us. Uh, so uh, again, we can help, uh, but really um, the brunt of the uh, challenge uh, and the uh, opportunity uh, really rests with the Chinese people themselves. So let me stop there, and I would welcome uh, any questions or comments that you might have. Thanks very much. Thank you, Dr. Economy. Uh, I'm going to be asking a few questions. Your talk raised quite a few. And I'm also going to explain to the audience that as I ask these questions, I'm not going to be looking back at Dr. Economy on the screen because she's actually seeing me on a screen from a camera that's out there. So the best way she can see me is if I look at you. So I'm not trying to be rude. It's just this is how this technology, this is all new to me too. I'm also going to take the moderator's privilege and just make one comment that occurred to me uh, as you were talking about China's efforts to clean up its environment and the central office in, in Beijing of the Chinese Environmental Protection Agency has 350 people. And it occurred to me it may be the single worst job in the world would be being the head 
of the Chinese Environmental Protection Agency. I mean, could there be anything harder uh, to do? The United US EPA has, well, I don't know the exact number, but well in excess of 15,000 employees for a country a quarter the size, uh, just to give you a rough idea of, of sort of the challenges that the Chinese officials, uh, the Chinese officials face. The way we're working the, these questions is that folks from the audience have emailed in quite a large number of questions, and I've, I've sort of condensed some of them and tried to put them uh, into some order, and you've actually already addressed several of them. Uh, so I'm going to sort of pick from the questions that people emailed in that I think dovetail well uh, with what Dr. Economy was talking about. And one of the first ones goes back to a, an early thing she said in her talk, which was about urbanization. China's urbanizing very rapidly. This means a lot of new construction. And one of the audience emailed in that they had been reading about some of China's new model sustainable cities, as uh, described by William McDonough, that uh, in, in his book, Cradle to Cradle, there are these sort of new ecological sustainable uh, cities. And, and I guess the basic question is, are these economically viable cities? Are these possible uh, models for Chinese urbanization? And, it, and if China does not urbanize this way, is it just because they're impractical or are there other obstacles uh, for this sort of urbanization? Uh, thanks very much for that question. Uh, in fact, I've had the privilege of working with uh, Bill McDonough uh, as a member of um, the board that he chairs, uh, the China-U.S. Center for Sustainable Development. Uh, and one of the, or several of the projects uh, that we've worked on uh, through this board uh, have targeted uh, the sort of idea of sustainable villages and sustainable cities. Um, I think um, Bill's book came out, and he was quite optimistic uh, at the time about the future of uh, these eco-cities in China. I think since that time, we've learned that it's uh, really quite a difficult uh, process and um, that oftentimes what uh, we in the West um, would like to have done in theory uh, tends to fall short in actual construction in China, sometimes because of mismatched understandings, expectations, lack of funding, um, so I, th I think um, to date, we haven't really seen uh, the blossoming of eco-cities in China that would serve either as models for China itself or certainly for the rest of the world. Uh, I'm hopeful that some of these will take place in the future, um, but really there's not a good uh, eco-city uh, now in China. Okay, thank you. Oh. You mentioned that the best thing the United States can do to help China with its environmental protection is lead by example. But I wanted to ask about two somewhat more localized efforts to help China become more environmentally sustainable. And, and I'm sort of blending a couple different questions here. Uh, but one was that what can people, say living in Colorado, do as consumers, if anything, to help encourage or influence the Chinese government or Chinese businesses uh, to make better environmental decisions? And what can businesses do? We had a really interesting question from someone who has a company that manufactures indoor air quality equipment. Uh, are there things that people in the business, I, I mean, do the Chinese even worry about indoor air quality at this point? And are there things people in American businesses can do to help uh, China make better environmental decisions? Uh, thanks. Um, you know, already, actually, American business is very actively engaged in many different ways uh, in China's environmental protection effort. Um, for example, Walmart uh, has undertaken a reasonably significant uh, initiative uh, to begin to reduce uh, its, the energy use uh, and the water uh, use uh, in the 100,000 or so factories uh, that it sources its products from. And so it's uh, started a process of auditing these factories and um, uh, ensuring that uh, ones that don't meet certain standards, lo local environmental protection regulations, uh, that they're no longer going to source from those factories. Uh, so I think that that's just one example uh, of an American company that's uh, trying to do uh, the right thing in China. Uh, in terms of, uh, but there are many, many others, frankly. And the issue, I, let me just make a point on the indoor air quality. Um, it is an issue that concerns the Chinese, certainly. Um, uh, 
I think there's the idea about um, the Chinese environmental sort of technology market, I, I think, has yet to be uh, fully explored. And whether this market is going to be uh, wide open uh, to uh, foreign uh, export uh, and investment, or whether the Chinese are going to attempt to make environmental technologies one of their pillar industries, which means they're really going to try to protect it and develop it on their own, uh, I think it remains to be seen. It's an, an important question, and I think probably we're going to have to do a lot of work uh, to, to push that door open in, in some ways. Uh, as far as what the American consumer can do, you know, it's interesting. This is an issue that is also engaging uh, Chinese NGOs uh, as they're thinking about uh, their own consumption patterns. Uh, and uh, they look to the United States as a poor model <laughs> uh, for and what they don't want to do uh, coming down the future. Uh, unfortunately, uh, what we've seen coming out of the Chinese as they get wealthier is that they tend to follow American patterns of consumption rather than, say, Japanese patterns of consumption. They like bigger cars. They like golf courses. They like big houses. Um, so here, too, there might be an example <laughs> for, for us to reduce our own consumption and, again, begin to lead by uh, example, um, because the Chinese seem at this point rather bent on following uh, the worst of, of our own practices. How encouraging. Um, uh, actually, related to this indoor air quality, one other somewhat minor, but not so minor point. You mentioned China's Environmental Protection Agency. Do they have an Occupational Safety and Health Administration type of agency for workplace environment? Um, they do. Uh, and they uh, ostensibly go through and, and monitor that. And you'll find signs in Chinese factories uh, reminding people about what they're supposed to be doing and, and not doing. Um, here, too, I think enforcement, as with environmental protection, uh, tends to be rather spotty uh, and haphazard. This issue about China developing uh, environmentally uh, uh, clean, sort of cleanup technology industries as part of its clean tech. One person asked, you know, is it possible that uh, Chinese severe environmental degradation is going to be the spur to developing a very large industry? Is it possible that the high level of environmental degradation can actually create a large enough market to spur the development of these new industries in China in a way that countries with uh, much less severe environmental problems much less severe environmental problems cannot. I, I think that's an entirely possible. I mean, one of the things we're seeing right now in terms of the issue of, of uh, water scarcity, a city like Tianjin, for example, is becoming a leader in desalination. Um, and uh, so rather than take uh, water, right now China is in the midst of pursuing a very significant uh, south to north uh, water transfer project, uh, taking water from the Yangtze River and trying to move it north. And Tianjin, interestingly, said, we don't want this water uh, because it's so polluted uh, that, you know, it will cost us much more to have to clean it up. We just don't want it. Um, and so we're not going to contribute any finances to this effort. Instead, you know, they started to uh, push forward on desalination. And as they've moved ahead, uh, the cost uh, has really decreased. And you can see uh, many other cities now in China thinking about desalination as a, as a technology that they want to develop and, and pursue. Um, so I think that there is that opportunity uh, when the situation becomes dire enough uh, in any given locality within China uh, for the Chinese to, to push forward on innovation and, and begin to, to make real changes to the way they're doing business. Okay. Quite a number of people asked a variation on this question, so I'm going to try and blend them together and hope I, I, I do it right. Uh, and, and particularly in comparing the state of Chinese environmental laws and Chinese environmental protection with U.S. environmental laws and U.S. environmental protection. And the question goes roughly like this. Uh, the United States and to a large extent Europe uh, caused a great deal of environmental uh, pollution as they were developing. And then later as they got richer, they basically, as one person put it, cleaned up the messes. Uh, can China, and for that matter other rapidly developing countries, uh, just follow the same development path. I mean, can we just say, well, China will get its per capita income up to a certain level, and then there will be pressure, and they'll just clean everything up, and all will be well? Or is there something special about the size and, and dramatic rise of China that makes that a, a sort of difficult or unpleasant model? 
I, t I tend to favor the, the latter uh, interpretation, frankly. Um, I think we're looking at a country, again, where you can see in Qinghai province, for example, they're saying, you know, 2,000 lakes and rivers have simply dried up uh, over the past few decades. Um, th that's not coming back. Uh, uh, you know, you're looking at a country, again, roughly the same size as the United States that's already severely, the land is severely degraded or desertified, you know, 25 percent of the land. Um, these are not challenges that the United States, for example, faced uh, in its developmental trajectory. Uh, China has gone much further along in terms of the degradation and pollution uh, along the curve, um, I think, than, than we had at a, at a much wider um, scale uh, and scope. So I, I tend to think that um, some of the, the challenges that China is facing, uh, in, indeed in terms of water pollution right now, uh, in terms of, you know, the um, uh, sort of loss of biodiversity, these things are irreversible. And uh, so I think that um, it is of a different uh, scale than what other countries have experienced. And you're looking at a country that has 1.4 billion people living on a land mass, again, roughly the same size as the United States. A sobering idea. It, the idea of loss of water and loss of resources brings us uh, to several questions that came in that relates back to your point about social unrest and environmental problems in China. And actually, I have two different questions here. One is, uh, is there any extent to which there are now sort of regional conflicts developing in China over the environmental degradation? That is, you know, one region's water being destroyed or, or polluted by a different region that's further upstream. And the second is, are there conflicts among the, the various ethnic communities uh, within China, do minority ethnic communities get hit harder by some of these environmental problems, or are they pretty uniformly spread across the society? Okay. Um, in, in terms of the first question, whether or not there are sort of uh, in, interregional uh, conflicts um, over water, absolutely there are. Um, and again, this south to north water transfer project is a good example. Uh, and the provinces uh, in the south uh, were very opposed to this uh, water transfer project. And they said, you know, Beijing, you should fix your leaky pipes, fix your leaky toilets, uh, start to conserve your water, raise your water prices. Why are you taking our water? Uh, in advance of the Olympics, uh, for example, uh, Beijing basically sucked uh, the neighboring province dry. Uh, the farmers uh, had to give up their crops for the season in order to provide the water to Beijing. Uh, so there are all sorts of water-based, water access-based water access conflicts uh, throughout the country, frankly, because the, China is still in the mode of doing a lot of river diversion projects. And once you're doing river diversion, you're clearly taking water from one place and moving it to a another place. Uh, water pollution and sort of interprovincial or certainly intercity, intervillage uh, is also a big problem. Uh, and sometimes the challenge is simply determining uh, where the factory pollution is coming from. Uh, and then assigning some kind of liability to it. And if it's one province to another, or even one city to another, it can be very, very difficult to get cooperation um, uh, among those cities, among those political uh, actors. Uh, so it's a very big problem uh, in China. Uh, in terms of whether or not the, the environmental challenges spread evenly throughout uh, the country or whether uh, certain groups are more disadvantaged than others, uh, I think that um, the problems are spread throughout the country, but probably some ethnic minorities, like the Tibetans, for example, uh, and, and parts of Western, the poor uh, areas of China, feel as though they have less of a voice. Uh, and I think uh, there was a point at which um, Jiang Zemin, back in the late 1990s, was pursuing a, a giant program called Develop the West, sort of uh, Open the West. Uh, but basically, the West believed this to be simply exploit the West and its resources uh, to feed the East. Um, so, but they are poor, and they don't really have a voice uh, the way that the Eastern coastal provinces do. Um, so I think um, that, yes, uh, the problems are, are throughout the country, but I think the minorities and poorer regions uh, feel more disadvantaged in terms of articulating uh, their issues. Uh, in competition with the wealthier parts of the country. 
Do you think that some of the social unrest you talked about earlier is based on those regional or ethnic differences, or is it more just a very local thing? This factory is polluting my river, therefore I'm demonstrating. Uh, I, I don't think that the social unrest is particularly ethnically rooted. Um, it really, you know, these protests are throughout the entire country. They're you know, in the wealthiest of cities, you know, Beijing, Guangzhou, Shanghai had a protest against the Maglev train uh, because they believed that the electromagnetic radiation from the train uh, was going to make them sick in the, the neighborhoods, was going to give them cancer um, because uh, the Shanghai government hadn't followed the German government's recommendations about how far from communities to site the train. Um, so these protests are, are everywhere, are really at every socioeconomic uh, level and, and uh, every part of the country. Okay, couple, just a couple other questions that came up. One is you mentioned uh, in what the U.S. can do to help China, and you mentioned capacity building. Could you just say a little more about what you mean by that, and, and particularly what the U.S. or Europe or other organizations can do? Well, I think, you know, what I'm referring to is, is really, um, again, providing um, and helping to develop the policy environment uh, for China. So, in fact, many Chinese environmental laws are modeled on U.S. environmental laws. Sometimes they're not, um, well, oftentimes, uh, they're not uh, brought down to the same level of specificity, which has proved to be a problem in China, because sometimes judges don't have enough guidance based off these laws. and not quite as comprehensive as our environmental laws, uh, but nonetheless, uh, sort of the fundamentals of uh, much of China's environmental legal system at this point uh, come from the United States. Uh, NRDC uh, is uh, an environmental NGO, uh, I mentioned uh, earlier, uh, is involved in uh, not only helping the Chinese to develop energy efficiency building codes, but helping to train uh, local officials to understand them, to work with developers, uh, and to think about how to enforce these codes uh, within China. Um, so I think these are the kinds of things that I'm talking about. It's very painstaking, uh, on the ground uh, kind of, of work. Uh, it's not glamorous, and it doesn't produce very short-term big results, but it's really the essence uh, of environmental protection in some ways. And many, many, many uh, groups within the United States, you know, Vermont Law School, many places are involved already in this kind of training and, and development. It almost sounds, I mean, I was wondering if, if we should start exporting lawyers. Is, that's a, uh, yeah, China could definitely use some more, some more lawyers. <laughs> um, The law school is going to have to start requiring Mandarin, I think, of all first-year law students. Uh, I, a, a sort of a final question, and it really comes from several of the questions uh, that people asked, but it kind of boils down to this. From listening to your talk, would you – this is a sort of an unfair question, I suppose – but would you say that you're optimistic or pessimistic about China's ability to get ahead of these issues and get, on, and get these problems under control before things get so bad? Uh, that both it inhibits their development and causes problems for the rest of the world? Um, well, I'm, I'm pessimistic uh, in the short term because I think already uh, the nature of China's development is causing problems for the rest of the world. I mean, we can see it uh, across the board just on the quick four issues that I ticked off, you know, climate change, uh, the import of illegally logged timber, uh, pollution of the Pacific, and Chinese multinationals going abroad and exporting worst environmental practices. So there's no doubt in my mind that already uh, the way that China is developing uh, economically is exerting a negative impact on the global environment. Um, over the long term, I'm more optimistic um, because I think that there is a growing consciousness uh, within the Chinese people uh, of, of their environment. And we see the same kind of trajectory, the same kind of curve um, that's been described by people like Ron Englehart and others about, you know, as you uh, get wealthier and your immediate needs are met, uh, you do take issues like education and the environment, and you begin to think much more seriously about the quality uh, of your life. And we see that taking place very clearly in China. 
Um, there are limitations, uh, as I suggested, because of the political system. Uh, so yes, I'd like to see a little more transparency, a little more official accountability, and a little more rule of law uh, in the country. I think that would be a great boon uh, to environmental protection. I think it's a major factor inhibiting uh, China as it tries to address these issues, as it tries to move forward on them. Uh, but over the long term, I am optimistic. Uh, but I think in the short term, uh, we're in for a very rough ride. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank Dr. Economy for joining us this evening. Uh, please drive carefully. Uh, all of us, but you too. Uh, this worked. We don't and, drive here. <laughs> and I'm very pleased that it did. Uh, thank you for coming this evening. This uh, uh, is one of the largest turnouts that we've had for one of these events. Uh, Dr. Economy's uh, talk was as clear and as informative uh, and as much of a learning experience that I've, that I've had in the last nine years. And I'd like to thank her for this. Uh, yeah.